Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Today, we're going to talk about one of your favorite VO2 max workouts and if they are making you slower. No such thing. Maybe if there's like an opportunity cost. (laughs) (laughs) That's our CEO, Nate Pearson. We also have uh, Ventum Bikes, IV Drain, and Trainer Road's IV Drain, of course, with us. Check out IV all over our Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. It's pretty great. And we also have Hannah Otto. Hannah, you're fresh off the plane from, well, not fresh off, but you you just came back from La Ruta, one of the most famous stage races. Did you see a python like we were fearing you would see in a river when you were crossing it? <laughs> I'm kind of disappointed. I did not see a python, um, but I was affirmed that they are there because people sent me photos from last year of like these huge pythons in the rivers with people walking across the rivers. So no pythons, but I saw a lot of animals while I was there. So I'm pretty pumped. <laughs> this is the Costa Rica one? Yeah. 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 In Costa Rica. So... La Ruta, it's a three-day stage race across Costa Rica. This year, it started at the Caribbean and ended at the Pacific. And you had a great ride. (laughs) You did great. Yeah, it was amazing. It was an absolutely incredible experience. It far and away exceeded my expectations. Uh, My goal was really just to go there to experience it because it is such a legendary race. And, you know, this race, it felt like it was... It was just for me, like it was just something that I wanted to do. And I think as professional athletes, it's still important to step back and remember why you love riding the bike and go on those adventures. But I gained so much more from it than I ever thought. I learned a lot. And I think in retrospect, a huge thing that I gained from it is adding tools to my toolbox and changing perspectives. So things that once seemed hard, they don't seem as hard anymore. Once you do (laughs) events like this and you experience some of these things, it really, um, I mean, uh, for an example, uh, something that I think a lot of people might be able to relate to is the hike a bike in Breck Epic Wheeler. Man, that's nothing. Let me tell you, (laughs) that's a sprint. Um, So it's just cool to watch some of those perspectives change for sure. Can I ask, I saw, I think you shared on your, on your Instagram, <laughs> the stage, one of the stages was like 76 miles long and like nine, th- almost 10,000 feet of climbing. Yeah. So stage two, <laughs> stage huge. two was 40, 40 miles with 10,000 feet. Whoa. And stage, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. And then stage three was 66 miles with 11,000 feet. So those two stages were, yeah. So for Leadville, which a lot of people know, that's like, what, 105 miles and like 11, 12,000 feet of climbing, right? 11,000. Right around there. So like twice as much in less than half the distance. I mean, sorry, just as (laughs) much climbing in less than half the distance, which means what are the descents like? Like, (laughs) that's what I'm worried Um, about. Everything is just incredibly steep. It is so, so, so steep. Do you have like a 10 tooth (laughs) chain ring on the front or something? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, so It's your bottom bracket. That's your thing. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Stage three I did with a 30, and that was money. I felt so good with a 30. Stage two I did with a 32, and I would 100% do a 30 next time. Um, Stage two... It w- the first 25 miles were all uphill. It was a 25 mile climb. You climbed uh, to the base of a volcano. And in those 25 miles was 7,000 feet of climbing. So, oh my gosh. It's, I mean, on average, it was like 15% gradient. And you did <laughs> plus, what I mean for perspectives you, for change. <laughs> plus pythons. Like, yeah, plus pythons <laughs> and magma. What, and, what other yeah. animals did you see? Like, um, I didn't see anything during the race. I think primarily because my head is they down, were there. just watching my power. They yeah. were watching me. Yeah, um, stalking. But at, I mean, outside of the race, we saw multiple sloths. We saw lots of monkeys. We saw poison dart frogs, and we saw the biggest crocodile. I have. I didn't even know crocodiles got that big. It was minimum oh. fifteen feet long. <laughs> How do you Florida people do this, by the way? Like, I see some of you Florida cyclists that I know, like. You just ride around and you like ride like a, there's an alligator or whatever, a crocodile in your bike lane. And you just like give him like you give him three feet like he's a car passing you or something. <laughs> I, I don't get that. I would not pass 
that's where I turn around. Like, don't don't yeah. ask the alligator. Yeah. It's insane. We have bears. Was it on the course? <laughs> but yeah. yeah. No, no. Yeah, exactly. I, <laughs> I turn around. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying the crocodiles were not on the course, um, or at least I didn't see them. That's really all I can say. <laughs> so how'd yeah. you do? Um, so I finished second in the elite women. Um, and yeah, I'm pumped on that. The yeah. first place woman was from Costa Rica. So she knows the course. I mean, massive kudos to her. Congratulations. Um, I, she crushed me on the hike of bikes. Uh, in the last stage, I had a two and a half minute gap on her around mile 50 of 66. And she just went flying by me on the hike a bike. And <laughs> when I said this at the finish line, explaining to people, everyone said, well, yes, of course they train carrying their bikes on their back. Apparently in Costa Rica, <laughs> this is literally something they do for training for this race is they go out and they do hill repeaks, carrying their bikes on wow. their backs. So um, how much so yeah. How, how long was the hike a bike section and then how much time did she put in you? So it started out where it was a rock slab and it's about 40% gradient enough where I'm using my hand as I'm hiking to crawl you in, up like, it. Carbon cycling shoes going up this. Like, yeah. And I also had toe <laughs> spikes too oh, in them because it, it way worse. changes to mud. <laughs> so at first it's this rock slab with water running down it. So you're just slipping and sliding. I'm trying to kind of walk on the edge of the vegetation. I'm trying to wedge my feet in the cracks. I finally get to the top of this rock slab and it gives way to mud. And I'm like, oh my gosh, thank goodness. Now I can actually walk. I took one step. The mud went up to my knee. No. My knee. This is not an exaggeration. No. So I'm worried I'm going to lose my shoe two feet under, first of all. Second of all, then it becomes, it's probably a 10 foot wide road, but it's like, it's so rutted. It's six inches above and then the rut is six inches and then six inches above. So are these peaks and valleys and the ruts are about three to four feet deep. So when I'm in the rut, most of my body is in the rut. And there's not room for my bike and my body in the rut because it's only six inches wide. So either I have my bike up three to four feet above me or my bike below three to four feet. And this is all super slippery, super thick mud. So I'm fall at one point I slipped. I fell. I fell all the way down the hill. I had just hiked oh, up, just like no. sliding. How down. far? How far? Was it fun at least? <laughs> <laughs> it would have been fun if I hadn't just been thinking, "Oh my gosh, that just took me ten minutes to get up." Oh. Oh. Um, I mean, so she she probably put in four minutes into me on this hike a bike. So annoying. And the entire hike a bike was. You got to get on your bike a couple times to ride small sections of it, but the whole thing start to finish was 8K, so four miles, and it took about an hour. Oh, my God. So yeah. are you going to start doing CrossFit and go back again next year? <laughs> or? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you, it. go ahead. What did you learn? You said you learned yeah, a lot of learnings, because like, in my mind, I'm looking at this, and I'm just like, I almost... Like, I don't know, I guess you learn how to like hike with your bike, but that's not relevant to the rest of your racing. So like, did you have takeaways that were relevant to your racing that you can apply now? Absolutely. I think there's, there's sort of different categories. So category one, like I said, is that perspective changing. Just how hard that was changes my perspective for other events and other races. I mean, like you just said, you just compared Leadville. That's 100 miles with 11,000 feet of climbing. All of a sudden, Easy. that doesn't seem like that much climbing. Of course, Leadville is its own beast, but perspective changed on that. Um, when it comes to the hike a bike, I think it was a major exercise in patience. You know, maybe I didn't learn something about how I'm going to hike with my bike, but I definitely learned how to work through that frustration of not moving as fast as you want and things taking longer than you want and having to adjust on the fly. I mean, when I entered this hike a bike, I was 15 miles from the finish. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm almost done. Right. And then this hike a bike is taking forever and I'm having to adjust. Oh, I, I'm, I'm not almost done. I need to change my nutrition plan. I need to change my hydration plan, my pacing plan. Like I'm having to make these adjustments on the fly. And then also just racing a lot of this blind, 
I think the retrospective aspect is huge in terms of the equipment. So the first stage was entirely flat and very bumpy, two and a half hours. We already talked about the second and third stage. The second stage was four and a half. The third stage was about seven hours. So all very different types of riding. And looking back on it, there's a lot of things I would change for my equipment from on stage two, given that long climb, I wouldn't have worn a pack if I had known on stage three, I actually should have had two packs and been able to switch them out because I a hundred percent ran out of fluids. I would have run that 30 tooth on stage two. I would have run a hard tail for the whole event. You know, you might listen, you think, Oh, Hannah's just woulda, coulda, shoulda. I have no regrets. I did it blind. But being able to look back and do the exercise of what would I change does apply to other races because I can start thinking about how I handled this and what I think could have been better and then look at other races and start to think about my equipment for those. And I think racing is becoming, at least at the highest level, is becoming very equipment intensive. And us athletes are having to become really intelligent and adaptable about the decisions that we make. Mm-hmm. what about can we talk about fueling because it's probably yeah. super hot and humid so like yeah. what do you do for how I'm, many carbs you take in in what form and then sodium and how'd you take that into okay i'm super glad you brought that up because that was i totally forgot about something else i was going to mention which is since it wasn't a big a race this was a chance to try all the things so <laughs> that's a way that i learned On as race well day. so yeah yeah (laughs) well it's funny because like you practice things in training and of course a hundred percent you need to but racing is still a little bit different for sure i'll get back to the feeling but one of the things i practiced is a more aggressive pacing strategy because that can be really scary when it's your a race and everything's on the line i don't want to blow up but i wanted to see what i was capable of so that was something on all these stages is i wanted to push my limits and my boundaries and on stage three that was I mean a seven hour race and my mindset was I'm gonna go full gas at the start and see what happens and I'm capable at least in that circumstance I was capable of so much more than I thought and so that opened my perspective as well to wow I can be starting these races a lot harder than I thought And I hope, I think that experiencing that eliminated some of that fear for me. Um, But nutrition was something that I, oh, God. I want to talk about that more because that idea of like a air quotes throwaway race or whatever, or like a C race, but it is regular distance, it takes so much stress off you too. I've had some of my best performances in the races that matter the least because I'm just like, just like you said, I'm just going to go out and try and there's no stress and you're not, you know, you sleep well the night before and all that sort of stuff. Hmm. I wonder if people would do that more if that would improve all their training. Cause you get to try that, right? Really try to go out so hard. Um, John tries this on every 40 K TT. He just goes, I want to see what happens if I go out as hard as I can for five minutes, just to get a little gap, then hold on. Theory, will yeah. anaerobic last for an hour. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Even on last week's podcast, we completely sucked in the, for the first like 15 minutes and we stopped and we redid it. <laughs> we did. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so I think that there's, there's something to that giving yourself the opportunity to try something and to fail without consequence. And Ivy, that's why you don't just show up. It's, I mean, I know this year you didn't race cyclocross nationals. You've talked about that before. That's why you like have all these races that you show up to because you give yourself the opportunity to try stuff, mess up and learn. I can't imagine though, as pros, the pressure to have like a really clean sheet, right. Of results. Cause is there pressure? Totally. Like you don't want to have some like back of the packs and, Yeah, it goes without saying. And I think there's the obvious pressure and then there's pressure within, you know, of you have certain expectations for yourself. And when you don't hit those expectations, sometimes it's not just that race. It can throw you off for multiple races because all of a sudden it's like, oh, my gosh, this person beat me and they've never beaten me before. What did I do wrong? Am I training wrong? Let me let me rework my entire offseason. Let me change everything I've ever known. And all of these things are wrong. But you can really really spiral and that's why I think it is important to have these moments where you can test things out and learn what you're capable of in a no consequence area especially for some of these long races because the long races I mean they are scary if you go too hard at the start of Leadville (laughs) you could be in for a horrendous day 
And so <laughs> no matter you what, really it's... want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, everybody signed up for it. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah. And so, so worse, yeah. yeah, ignore Nate. <laughs> in my mind, especially in these long races, it's scary to try thing, new things out, including nutrition. I don't want to try something new and end up with stomach problems for a seven hour event that sounds terrifying mm -hmm. and so it is really nice to have some of these opportunities in these days in races that are the duration that we do to try some of these things without that consequence without feeling like I failed myself or somebody else or whatnot it's like the goal of this day is to try this thing and as long as I try it, it's a success I know for me when I have that like pressures off kind of approach. I might perform really well, but that like extra little bit of fight mm. to win is mm. sometimes missing when I assign this race to be like, it's a practice race, it's not that important. I can try these things and I forget about this competitive part or I can't like tap into it, you know? Do you ever experience that? Ooh, that's such a good question. And I think that's also one of the ways that I can tell when I'm tired. You know, like when you maybe have overreached a little bit or you're getting towards the end of your rope in the season, you still can feel really strong and be performing well, but you lose a little bit of that fight. So, yeah, to answer your question, definitely, um, especially, I think, because in those sea races, you're probably going in more tired. And so I think all of that contributes. And that's where I think, again, the process goals are really important because I might not have the fight to out sprint someone for every single track, but I can find the fight to maybe hit my own specific power numbers and things like that. So turning things more internal has helped me be able to battle some of that mental side. And um, I'm not a pro, uh, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> Hannah and Ivy do this really well. And I wish more pros would do this is the vulnerability of when something does go wrong. You say why and what you're trying to do. Um, and it's not like an excuse of, oh, it's just a C race. That's why. But it's like, oh, I tried this and this worked out or this didn't. And getting the insight into your training, into your racing, into your lives like that is so compelling um, for people watching. I'm talking to other pros that might be listening for the audience. And that's what, what sponsors just want an audience, right? Of someone they can trust. And if you give those like vulnerability, the trust goes way up rather than just being like, I am this perfect person that never makes a mistake. They, that, that's not relatable. <laughs> mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, Nate. Uh, I'm not a pro, so this is, um, but, but my own experience of stepping through this, Ivy, I had a really hard time with that because it was fear driven because it was like, well, shoot, if I do allow myself to be hyper competitive and it doesn't turn out well, then man, that's going to like completely blow my confidence mm -hmm. up. And I'm afraid of, of the negative voice in my head becoming true. Yeah. You know, um, I don't want to give it any sort of evidence to be able to fulfill that. And that was hard for me to understand at first and how to manage that because I would go into a race and it was like on one end of the spectrum and I would have to be like, I'd be like, it's fun, John, it's fun, it's fun, it's fun. And like <laughs> remind myself over and over so that I wouldn't be hyper competitive. And then on the other side of things, then transitioning back into, okay, now I should be able to perform now is when I do that. It'd be really tough. But um, man, the, the biggest thing that helps me with that, if somebody's listening to this and it resonates with them, is like, you've heard me talk about it, too much detail and you might dislike it even where I'm very detail oriented about a specific pacing plan or a nutrition plan or something else or a technique. And I am going out specifically to nail that and I will focus all of my energy into that. And when I do that, that's the goal accomplished for that race. Um, so what I find is like, I, and Nate, I don't know if you relate to this, but I have like a huge amount of like intensity and energy in reserve. And if I don't channel it actively, it can be pretty wild. That's why mm -hmm. like as a kid, sports are really hard because it's so hyper competitive. I felt so much, mm -hmm. you know, and I put it all into the sport. And then as an adult, it's been all about learning about where to channel that and then how to like, instead of just trying to stop it off and block it, but instead just allow it to find like its avenue. And that's really helped me be able to go through races with different goals and different outcomes and still find the benefit and still improve from all of them. Mm -hmm. But it's gotta be so different if you're a pro to your point, Nate, because I know pros are looking at results sheets of every one of their competitors. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're like looking at those and they're like, Ooh, they finished fifth, not first today. Like, you know, and, and they're, they're looking at that and they're trying to find reasons to, to knock them down a few pegs in their mind. I think it's always because then that way they can go into the next race with a bit of a mental advantage. I right? think it's also the opposite is really good because then they, they don't think of you as a threat. You know, they may 
they mark somebody else. I think it's always better to be super fit, but everyone doesn't think you're as fit as you are mm-hmm. in my experience. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a good perspective. Yeah, for sure. What'd you do on the carb side? Did you throw a big swing there too? I wouldn't say a big swing, but one of my goals this year is to increase my grams per hour on the bike and also to dial in some of my off the bike race prep nutrition, Mm. AKA increasing my carbo load for some of these long races. And so that was something I had the opportunity to test. So usually I would say I'm closer to 70 to 80 grams an hour on the bike. And this race I was aiming for 90 to a hundred. And I think that this was a really beautiful opportunity for that because I would experience all the emotions that I typically experience in a race, which is, you know, basically I'm in the middle of this. I can't take my hand off the bar to eat something. And (laughs) then I would think if you're not willing to do it in this race, how would you ever do it in another race? There is no excuse here. And then I would force myself to take my hand, you know, drink the mix, eat the liquid shot, whatever it is. And I would discover, oh, wow, that cost me nothing. That cost me no time. And so again, just putting that in my mind, teaching myself to make time for that, making it automatic. I think, again, it's just a a huge thing looking forward towards next year. I want to hear about the pre-race carb loading. That's like an amazing topic. What did you do? What were your, what's your thoughts on it? Your strategy? Yeah, I've been working with a nutritionist and we've been working, um, you know, a no fiber or I guess not no fiber, but low fiber diet going into some of these longer events and then increasing the carbs. And one of the ways that has been really helpful for me to think of increasing the carbs is we talk about just adding basically just a little bit each time I sit down to eat, which I'm aiming to have some sort of significant meal every like three to four hours. And then, so like if I typically would eat yogurt and granola when I'm carb loading, I'll do yogurt, granola, and honey. Um, So I'm adding like that extra layer where I'm not making myself feel overly full by having a normal day and then sitting down and eating a massive plate of pasta. Instead, I'm I'm adding just a little bit every time I eat throughout the whole day. Have you tried sitting down and eating nice. an entire box of cinnamon toast crunch at once? <laughs> <Because> <laughs> it works. <laughs> Maybe that's a pro. So you should try that next time. I feel like you got to work your way into it though. Right? Like that, that is a good approach because if you just try it all of a sudden put some, and your gut's not used to tolerating that, put some tough. cinnamon toast crunch. I your did. Granola. I did find after one of the stages, we stopped at a gas station just to get more jugs of water and stuff. And there was this massive loaf of like dolce de leche cake. And I was like, oh yeah, that's, I ate the whole thing that night. That's awesome. (laughs) Nice. There we go. One more question. How many days Uh, before your race do you start uh, doing the strategy of increasing your carbs? uh, Three days before. Yep. Mm. And I feel like you, nice. doesn't this set, make things like unbound just sound so like peaceful and restful? <laughs> like, I feel like your new skill set is that you could take away from this or that you probably will is when things go sideways, you're surprised by something in a race. Like, I feel like you w- will just be so calm now because you've handled things so much more surprising and tricky. I agree. And I actually want to caution my brain with that because there's always going to be things that surprise me and I've never done unbound. So I definitely want to go in with like full respect for that sort of distance. Um, but at the same time, it is really nice. Exactly what you're saying is I have to admit, I have a level of confidence of, I've seen some really, really hard things and I was able to overcome them. So (laughs) even if, yeah, exactly. What if Python had, Uh, or what if Unbound had pythons in the water crossings? Oh, I mean, I'd win. Yeah, not in in Kansas. They don't tolerate that stuff there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Good times. Well, good job, Hannah. Good to hear you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Super fun. Well done. Highly recommend if anyone wants a big adventure. Wait, are sure. you going back next year? I will definitely be back. We'll see if I cool. go back next year or in the future. But for it's funny because I, in some ways, I did go sort of like, this is a bucket list event. You know, I'm going to go and experience it. And Clayton and I both left like, oh, 100%. We're going to be back to this um, mm-hmm. for the event, for the people, for the place, for the country. Like, we loved all of it. So mm-hmm. it was amazing. Cool. That's cool. 
Cal sent in a question to trainerroad.com slash podcast. And if you have a training question, you can do the same. Cal says, I just got back from cyclocross national championships and had a disappointing performance due to being sick before the race. But even if I wasn't sick, I'm not sure I would have been prepared for that race. I've had a coach for the past three years that has been great for taking me from just being a cyclist to a racer, but I've questioned some of the training I've been given and haven't gotten satisfactory answers. I wonder if Cal's name is not Cal and it's like totally different. And <laughs> Cal's worried about being out of here, but, um, thanks for sending the question in Cal. You can always use pseudonyms by the way, everybody. Uh, Cal says, I think it's time for a change. And I wanted to see if you could help answer my questions. When we first started training, I really struggled with long VO2 max intervals. So we decided long is like, you know, we're talking three to five minutes. Typically those are like the, the traditional longer VO2 max intervals. And they suck. <laughs> they are really hard <laughs> for sure. Um, really painful. Uh, so we decided to try 30 seconds on 30 seconds off style intervals instead. And they were much more reasonable to complete thing is we've kind of stuck with that. And I found myself lacking in races when it comes to hard efforts that are higher than the efforts in my VO two max on off intervals and also lacking if the course had sustained sections. A typical training week for me has been two hard workouts following this same VO2 format and the rest is conversational pace. Overall, my training feels easy and I'm able to complete or to be consistent with it and hardly ever miss a workout. Every once in a while, I do one of our hard local group rides or a Zwift race, or sometimes my coach gives me a random sweet spot workout to change things up. I'm 43 years old. This is my fourth year racing and I had no prior sporting experience other than typical team sports as a kid. I'm a GC for a, a general contractor, I assume, for a national home builder. Yeah. So while I do have a lot to do every day, my work is not overly physical and my schedule is fairly flexible. We have three kids, 12, 10, and seven, and all are involved in sports of some kind, but that's not a big uh, source of stress for me. In fact, it's a pleasure. All right. We got all the details. Now, my questions are as follows, and we should take these ones one mm -hmm. at a time, I think. Uh, what is the coaching goal of on-off VO2 max intervals? And what do they, and do they not prepare you for? Uh, who wants to take this one? Hannah, <laughs> you, you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, ready to, I'm ready too. But yeah, to, I mean, I think first. we all need to really tackle this one because there's a lot to unpack here. Um, so the first thing I think one of the major goals of sort of those on off 30 sec 30 thirties is time and intensity. So by having those 30 second recoveries in between, you're able to theoretically accumulate more time at the high intensity than you could if there was no recovery in between. Um, so that's one of the goals. And I think it, that's one of the reasons why this was the thing that your coach gave you when you struggled initially. Uh, so you couldn't hold that intensity for the entire three minutes. So how can we still accumulate three minutes of VO2 max work? Well, we can do it by adding those 30 thirties up. The problem is, is that was what you did in order to get to that point. And you didn't level up is what I'm hearing is at some point you needed to have made that jump to now I'm doing the entire VO2 workout the way that workout's designed. So, or increase the amount of 30-30s as well. I mean, as pros, you might not just be doing three minutes of 30-30s. You could be doing 20 30-30s, and then you're accumulating even more time at that VO2 effort that you couldn't. Um, but that's the whole point is you're trying to accumulate the time that you couldn't otherwise. And if you hit a point in which you could accumulate that back-to-back, -back, you're selling yourself short and you won't you won't continue to improve. There's also with 30 thirties, um, it's a little bit easier mentally, I think than the sustained VO two max. I was just looking for it, <clears throat> but there's a study that compared 30, 30 on offs or, uh, like on off VO two max versus like a traditional sustained power. And they found that it was with the same, in, um, effort, the same, uh, benefit was from both. And people like to show that I said, Oh, I should just do 30 thirties cause they're easier. But the thing is, it's the effort was matched, right? So if you, if you hate VO2 max, the long ones, you have to hate the, the 30 thirties. You have to go just as deep and just as hard for it to match. Um, and then I think there's a little principle of specificity at the end where if your race does have sustained like three, four minute efforts, um, although the other one might raise your VO2 max or have some other outcome, the same, I would really, as you get closer to race day, do those really very specific of what you're going to do in race day, especially for cyclocross. Um, and I know in our, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but in our plans, the specialty phase, 
uh, if you like our three workouts that are going to be the, uh, the key workouts, one is an anaerobic day where it's like, you're hitting really hard, really short, having a little bit of rest and hitting hard again, but it's, there's more than like a, a 30, 30. And there's a traditional VO2 max day. And we've already brought you through a progression of the floats or, or the, sorry, the 30 seconds on 30 seconds off. We do that. Then we build you into another phase into more of the sustained traditional. I think that's a little bit mental, uh, mentally a, a good progression there. And then on the Saturday workout, we do VO2 max float sets, which are, you're kind of like recovering at like high sweet spot, not recovering air quotes. And then you're hitting VO2 max and you're just pegging between those two. And that's very, very much like a cyclocross race where it's just like, it never ends. And you're like, why isn't this ending? And that's the kind of the, what we do. <laughs> very you know, accurate description. Yeah. What it feels like. <laughs> that's the, the, the final eight weeks before <laughs> exactly. your A race. But that, I think those three, uh, workout profiles really help uh, get you tuned in for that race day. And I could see if you are just stuck on 30 thirties the whole time. And as Hannah said, you're not actually progressing them and your RPE isn't, you know, the RPE should stay high, very high, um, as you're going through there and you're either increasing the duration of each, like reducing the rest period or increasing the number of, uh, repeats on those as you're progressing through closer to your race. If you're staying the same, you're like stagnant. You're not getting any faster. You also There's might not be going hard enough. That's another thing is if you're only taking 30 seconds rest, it's possible that you're not pushing up high enough in order to make it as effective as it can be. I mean, I know that when my coach gives me long rest in between VO2, I'm not thinking, woohoo, easy day today. I'm thinking, oh gosh, I have to go that much harder on these. Um, so longer rest just equals higher intensity. It doesn't equal easier. Yes. Um, really well said, Hannah. And I, I want to use like an analogy to explain the goal here. So you said like the goal of 30 thirties is time and intensity and perhaps more specific than that. It's time at peak aerobic uptake. Mm -hmm. Cause like the goal of VO2 max training is you're trying to, you're riding right at your limits in terms of your per performance, where your body is taking in processing and utilizing as much oxygen as possible. And the more time you spend toward that limit, then you can increase that capacity, right? And you can have greater capacity as a result. Like that's like your body's reaction to that. It'll say, Ooh, I guess I need to increase this ability. So the interesting thing is that if you've ever used like a gas burner, you know, a gas burner, you can on your stove, you can dial in exactly how much heat you want and it's set. But if you use like an electric cooktop, it pulses. So like a lot of the time it will turn on and get it really hot and then it turns off and then it will go back on and off. And the higher the, the temperature that you have, it'll either stay on all the way if it's all the way maxed out or it'll just pulse more frequently and have less downtime. And it's a lot like your 3030s <coughs> in the sense that if you're measuring the actual heat output of what's going on with that pan and how much heat it's getting, it, when it's pulsing like that, it's still getting a lot of heat but it is different than if it was just at a constant heat that whole time. And, man, the, the benefits that you get, yes, like Nate said, there's studies that show that you can get the same benefit from it, but you're trying to increase the amount of time your body is at peak aerobic uptake. And 30, 30 is a lot of the time they should be up at the top of the VO2 max range, which is usually 120% of your FTP. But in many cases, you'll see them go beyond that. And that's why in our cyclocross plans, you'll start out with 30, 30s, like in the base phase to the build phase you'll have like a bit of 30 thirties, uh, mixed in, in the beginning or toward the end of your base phase. And then as you go on, they become anaerobic. They go outside of that 120% bound. So you're pushing harder and Ivy it's, I don't know if this resonates with you, but like in a cyclocross race, you can't just cap your efforts at 120%. Like no. you have to go way deeper than 120%. So if in this case, Cal's just been doing 120% 30 thirties and just stick into that, yeah, it makes sense why you'd show up on race day and be feel like you're not prepared. Yeah, I think that's exactly what's happening. And um, maybe even not hitting those shorter VO2 max efforts, a high, high enough intensity as it needs to be, reading that Cal feels like they found themselves lacking in races when it comes to hard efforts that are higher than the efforts in my VO2 max on-off intervals. So I don't think Cal's VO2 max 3030s are hard enough now. Um, and not dipping into that lower end of anaerobic that really prepares you for that effort on race day. I think those are the things that are missing. Yeah. The second question is, should I be doing more intensity? And if I did, what impact would that have on my training? That's hard um, to answer. It, yeah, it is hard to answer, right? Yeah. yeah. Cause we, we don't know how much intensity he's doing. Yeah. We don't have your training plan or anything else like Cal. You'd mentioned two days, two intense days a week, and then the rest is conversational pace. 
And I think that depending on how many days you're training, what your total training volume is and everything else, I do think that you might be able to get more than just, you know, your two hard days and the rest easy pace. You could probably do more intensity yeah. than that. Mm -hmm. But above all, maybe it's less a question of more and like what, right, Hannah? Like, yeah, I, that's what I was going to say is I, without more information, I would say maybe you could push it up to three really intense days a week. Um, but I am less interested in you doing that initially and more interested in you changing what those two days are first. So I would say, let's change those two days, create novel stimulus within those two days by doing different types of workouts. And then if you're still handling that well, let's add another day. Yeah, it's, it says here, a typical yeah. training week for me has been two hard workouts following the same VO2 format, meaning on-offs, and the rest is conversational pace. Overall, my training feels easy and I'm able to be consistent with it without hardly ever missing a workout. To Hannah's point, like two days of on-offs, I would not do the same probably workout both those days. Maybe hit like a kind of a threshold on one day and then a VO2 max the other, change up the VO2 max, and then either extend the time of those workouts to be more intervals or insert a third intensity day spaced with the right recovery. But it sounds like, I mean, if it feels air quotes easy, like who here has ever progressed and their training just felt easy? No one, right? Like, <laughs> nope. That's I, it. Shouldn't. Yeah. It's intentionally yeah, it, hard. <laughs> it, it, it's not easy, right? Like, so I think I think you know your answer is you're just not going hard enough. Yeah, yeah. Reaching out to like a more like I know the answer. I just want your yeah. confirmation, sort of thing. <laughs> to, to that point, really quick though, Nate, we should talk about this because when we say that, like, yeah, when you're progressing and you're improving, training is hard. We don't mean that you're completely destroyed no. every day because if you if you go into every workout and you're just cooked and you don't have it in you to be able to keep doing like your hard stuff and you dread your workouts and you're, you need to do less, less volume, less intensity, something you need to do less. And that's hard for most of us type A athletes because we feel like we need to be pushing to our limits whenever we're training. And then that's what makes it productive. But you know, it's not if you want to do less, you can go to our training plans and choose master's training plans to have two intense days instead of three because you'd be the opposite. Uh, wait, I had one more point on that. Um, doing less VO2 max. Oh, what did you say? I forget. Can I share another point? Actually, Nate, this will be relevant mm -hmm. to you. I'm going to see if I can find this study. I'd have to dig it up. I believe that the stronger by science guys were the ones that shared this, but they were looking at a study. This is lifting. So I know it's not cycling, but they're looking at like, um, lifting Nate. And I think that they were doing high rep counts and they were like going till exhaustion or going to like a point where they were like, this should be productive or going so that every set felt like you were like pushing yourself to your limits. I'm describing this study poorly in the very general mm -hmm. terms, because there's this theory that like, once it gets really difficult, that's when the growth is happening. That makes a lot of logical sense. And in some respects, yes, that growth is increasing in terms of it's like, you know, the, the strenuous nature of whatever you're doing is increasing. But Nate, I remember they found in that study that like the people that were pushing it beyond what they like, and to, like the people that felt like they needed to push every set beyond, they were not getting any stronger. It than the people that were just doing something that so was I know measured. I know a lot about this now that there is that's called the, the idea of reps in reserve is when you when you're training yes like how many extra reps could you have done if when you stopped um you could think of like intervals in reserve for us too and uh again, this is not aerobic training right this is strength training and they were wondering is should you have reps in reserve or should you go to failure and there's this idea of like effective reps of maybe the first if you're going to 10 the first eight really don't matter but then the last 10 do and there's the whole thing about volume inside and actually there's the, the, the science has changed because I, I know that same thing article you're talking about is that going to failure actually is much better and it almost is exponential at the very mm -hmm. end for strength training is you want to go to failure then there's this like stretched long length stretch partials meaning after failure with a muscle you get it in the stretch position the long length position when it is so for uh for bicep curls it would be like your arms are extended and then you do a little partial half mm -hmm. like uh half or uh, one quarter reps in there. And that also increases the results of it. And then on top of that, they have a number of sets per week. They find that growth increases up to about 10 sets per muscle group per, per week, but actually one, it, like at three, it's pretty close. It's like three, it's like 65 or 80%. And then it kind of wow. goes, uh, maybe not 80%. Then, then at eight it's there. And then at 10, it's a little bit less. But after that, it can actually be detrimental to your, um, to the impact. Uh, I think as cyclists, yeah. we very, so the, so the basically, oh, we, we almost never do things to absolute failure. You know, I don't know about you guys or like Hannah with training, but we, we almost never test. do. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, thank you, AI for <laughs> detection for keeping me safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I would say on these hard, on these really hard days, especially if you're trading like this, it almost looks like a polarized. And I don't want to put words in the coach's mouth, but at the end of those hard days, you should be like, "Whoa, that was so hard! Oh my gosh, I'm so happy for my next day of recovery." You shouldn't be like, "I could do that workout again." Um, and then at the right, and yeah. then at the end of like when you get to recovery weeks, you should be like man, I'm glad there's recovery week. I am pretty tired. You shouldn't feel like, well, I could just train through this the whole time. Uh, you don't want the opposite where at the end of the first week, you're like, oh shoot, I need a recovery week. And after you take a day off, you're like, oh, I'm dreading this next hard day. I'm not recovered yet. And that's probably a conversation with your coach or, uh, you know, you can do this yourself with train road. I mean, obviously you could. Yeah. I'm yeah. not trying I'm to like coach, body but, slam this coach. Train. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, feel so bad, but this is a strength of, um, train road and, your progression levels and your workout levels changing constantly as you move through your training. Like I wonder when the last time Cal really addressed or reassessed where, where their fitness was with their coach or through testing, you know, and it's just so nice that that's something that we don't have to, we don't have to do anymore. And the work is done for you and you never are guessing if it's the right intensity or the right level and how much has Cal been leaving on the table because those workouts should have been leveled up that the nature of those VO2 max workouts should have changed, should have increased in intensity, should have um, increased in duration to get that higher cumulative time. You know, there's a lot of guesswork when that isn't being assessed in the way the trainer run does. This is kind of what Hannah said is, uh, you could just be like on the next workout, let's see if I go 130, what happens? 130% and like YOLO. And you can always do the first five <laughs> intervals that way and then turn it down, you know, afterwards. But if you never test it, you'll never know. It could be like unbreakable and you could, it could be way higher than you think it is. Ooh, right. Yeah. He just keeps putting the weights on. He's like, Whoa, Ooh, good I can't pull. <laughs> this is yeah, crazy. Yeah. I didn't know I could do this. Yeah. Such a good scene. <laughs> yeah. Or add more, add five more 30, 30s on the end. You know, you can, you can do it in very more power. Ways Cal. Um, I want to see more power from you. Yes. Also, there's something with 30, 30s is that, uh, you could have a high anaerobic work contribution to it. And if that's the case, uh, I think the cure for that is to either do traditional or just have shorter time uh, rest between intervals and the first couple intervals you'll get it but then you'll start to go oh goodness gracious and it will start to go away because um, if you have a really long rest and some of the lower uh levels of train road of the uh, workout levels do have long rest um, you can just kind of j- jump through those pretty quickly you could really restore those anaerobic stores and you're not hitting the system that we want to hit you're not you're not having that sustained vo2 max uptake a maximum air uptake that oxygen uptake that we want yeah. That's exactly the what I was going to say. Is, I was going to say, let's make them 30, 15. Yeah. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Good call, Hannah. I like it. The third question is if you were to outline which types of workouts are most important for cyclocross racers, what, the, what would they be? I'm just going to run people through the mid volume plan and then we can show this on screen so people can see it too. Um, but effectively, uh, I'll just run you through what sort of workouts you'll be doing on which day of the week, um, for the non masters plan. So the normal one, Tuesday anaerobic steps. So those look like anaerobic intervals that we talked about the on off sort of thing, but they start high and then they might, it's kind of fun. So they'll start high and a little longer, a little shorter. And then what happens is that they'll or a little shorter. And then as the intensity, every one you go through, it'll drop a little bit in intensity. They'll also, it will shrink the rest in between intervals and then they'll get a little bit longer and then you'll get to a kind of a certain point where that hits like a valley and then you'll reverse that. So it's like ladders in the sense where you'll step your way down, then step your way back up and that'll be the set. And, and we, really what you've seen in two uh, and like in a they, cyclocross race, you always have that time where you're sprinting out of corners. There's these sustained anaerobic repeats without it uh, throughout the course that always happens. Uh, I mean, almost every course. Yeah. Yeah. Quite specific Wednesday endurance. Thursday, VO2 max intervals, Friday rest, Saturday, VO2 max float sets. So what those look like is you're typically, um, you'll do 15 seconds in, in VO2, high VO2 territory, and then you'll do 15 to 30 seconds at like sweet spot to threshold. And then you'll repeat that something like, you know, eight times for a set or 10 times for a set, 12 times for a set, depending on where your abilities are. It'll progressively increase every week as you do them. And that'll be a set. And those are really good at keeping you up at peak aerobic uptake because you don't settle in all the way. And in cyclocross, when you're riding on grass and you can't coast, (laughs) so like you always have to stay on the gas. It's really specific stuff. And then Sunday's endurance. If you do a master's plan, I'll go through this one quickly. Tuesday, anaerobic steps. Wednesday and Thursday are endurance. Friday, you'd have rest. Saturday, you'd have VO2 max float sets. And then Sunday, you would have endurance. So 
those are like options and those, that's what we feel quite literally what we feel would be like the best plan, but really the consistency thing's important, right? Ivy. So like, um, that's mid volume, maybe low volume be better, but consistency can, is key. Yeah. For someone like Cal or looking at a new training plan and thinking about joining trainer road, um, a mistake I feel like athletes could make is to look at their training right now and say, okay, I do these two workouts and then all this other endurance time. And so that equates to like, 10 or 12 hours a week. So I'm going to pick a high volume training plan and do 10 or 12 hours a week of structured workouts and then just (laughs) absolutely implode and start and fail workouts and (laughs) don't understand why. And they think it's a problem with the training and then they start missing workouts. And the best plan that you can pick is one that you can consistently complete the workouts during. And I feel like that was the biggest difference for me in getting a lot faster was being consistent with those key workouts. And it's to a certain degree, like, honestly, I feel like I could do a 40 K TT training plan. And if I just did the workouts consistently would be so much more impactful than the specificity of like, this workout prepares you for this kind of thing on race day to some degree, just like doing those workouts was the best preparation for me. It just did the most for my fitness because I was consistent, you know? Um, So for Cal, when you're choosing a training plan, choose something that you know you can not just like barely do, but absolutely knock out of the park every week. Um, I think that's the best training plan that you can pick in terms of volume and intensity. Like pick the thing that you know that you'll absolutely crush. And as you get faster, and your fitness increases, you don't have to then necessarily up your volume a bunch, you know, your workouts will get harder and more specific. And um, yeah, just choose the thing that you can consistently complete. Would be but, not make, but not make it so easy. It shouldn't just be easy. Cause there's, you know, cause that's what he said. It's crushes in, uh, you do the hard workouts and you're not, you're not feeling um, totally drained, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're like skipping yeah. workouts cause of fatigue. Right. So like if Cal trains eight hours a week right now, let's say, but only does those two workouts a week that are hard. And maybe that's like two hours of riding a week and the rest are just, you know, conversational pace, group rides of friends, whatever, like messing around on Zwift. If, if he were to try to now do eight hours of structure, I think it would be really tough for him. So I think that's what we, I'm trying to suggest they prevent, like, don't try to slowly step up the amount of structure work that you do. Don't just like dive right into a whole bunch of intensity, a whole bunch of workouts per week. It's not, not setting yourself up for for success. Yeah. Well said, uh, Craig's question, and it flows into, there's kind of two of them that blend together here. So Craig says, Hey host, big fan of five star podcast Raider writing in for the first time. You can rate the podcast just like Craig did on Spotify it would be amazing. You can now watch the podcast on Spotify. Pretty darn cool, which is great. Um, you can also go into Spotify and ask and answer questions that we can post. So we can post questions and then you can answer them every week within there. So like, um, if there's specific questions to how you guys want us to use that feature, let us know. Um, cause it could be fun. So if you're watching, <laughs> this is disjointed. If you're watching on YouTube, let us know how you'd want us to use that feature over on Spotify. Um, so, uh, Craig says, I'm a big F1 fan and I can't help but notice how simplistic and one dimensional cycling training is compared to what these guys do. One day they're in the gym, next on the bike, next training reflexes, next training breath holding, etc. Are pro cyclists actually doing other stuff we don't know about? <laughs> uh, and then the next question kind of dovetails into this. But Ivy, do you have thoughts before we move into the next one? Uh, uh, I just, you know, do F1 ra- racers, drivers get to drive an F1 track every day as part of their training, though? You know, as cyclists, we get to go do our thing in practice every day um if we Mm. want to i wonder i don't know much about f1 but i wonder if that's why they have the like simulators and things at home because they don't get to go practice in person every single day yeah sims sims are like as close as they get i guess to to replicating that and but yeah it's expensive for an f1 team to do like a track day you know they can't just go and do that every day it'd be it'd be unrealistic for it um, Hannah, do you do let's go into Mario Sam's Kart question, and then we can touch back to that. And, <laughs> to practice yeah. reflexes. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read Sam's question because I think this will be good, uh, f- applicable for Hannah. It says, possibly a niche question, but I didn't see much about it. What do you guys know about reflex reaction training and can it be beneficial to cycling and racing? 
What I mean is the training meant to speed up your reactions. I feel like it would be beneficial to racing in a peloton where reacting to the movements and changes of racers around you, but also that split second decision of which wheel to follow in the sprint. I've seen different athletes use this in training, like boxers, running backs and football, etc., and thought it would be applicable to cycling as well. Do you have any tips or resources about where to start with something like this? Have you ever done reaction training? I've seen those like they're, they're lights that will, you can stick lights on a wall, for example, and they light up and they don't go like you have to hit it. And when you hit it, the light goes away and you'll set up like an array of lights and you'll go through like a whole like set where you're kind of going through and doing it's that. Have you ever done that, it. Hannah? Or ever felt the need? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good call, Ivy. Have you ever done that, Hannah? I have not done it to that extent. Um, I do know that a lot of downhill racers do practice reflex training. Sometimes you'll even see them warming up uh, before they do their actual race run and they sometimes they'll even have those lights like you're talking about also reaction training doesn't have to be that fancy and that's where I think you'll see a lot more like XC or just in general cycling athletes doing it is it can be as simple as um you know tossing a ball like you're you're reacting and reflexing to where that ball is going or sometimes you'll a lot of the time see us do it in strength training um it could be, you know, a coach holding up different things. And maybe while you're in a plank, you're doing the reflexes according to that. So I definitely think it exists. Um, I also wonder in some of these sports, how much they do it, right? Like if you have a camera coming to your house to show every type of training you're doing, you're going to show every type of training you do, not what you do every single day on a standard day. So th I think there's also give and take there. Um, but yes, to answer your question, cycling athletes do do it. But I think another reason you see it less with road cyclists and XC athletes is I think that endurance athletes have another barrier in what we pick to train. And that's that our sport itself requires so many hours in the saddle training our physical body so if you're already putting in 20 to 30 hours a week in the saddle you really have to be selective about what you want to do on top of that it would seem from the outside looking in well you're a professional athlete it's your job but my job is also to rest so that I can be as good as I can possibly be in the next training session and so you do have to be selective about adding things in like breath hold, reflex training, uh, you know, on, honestly, even cooking, even social media, like all of these things take time and energy. And as an athlete, you're constantly having to weigh, is doing this more valuable than resting? Is resting more valuable than doing one less hour of training? Everything is weighed on this give and take scale. And I think especially for endurance athletes, a lot of the time, the time doing your very specific intentional sport does tip the scale. Okay. Shout out to all the people that are like, have an absolutely overflowing bucket, but they're throwing in ice baths on top of that <laughs> and throwing in all these other things, right? Like those of us that are middle-aged folks are very susceptible to, and very targeted through a lot of marketing efforts for a lot of different things that we can do to get better at training and, and better at recovery in particular. Sign up today at trainer.com. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's just it. You have to step back and look like if you had to drop and just do one thing, what would actually drive you further toward your goal? And it's your training yeah. on the bike, right? Mm -hmm. And all the other stuff just takes away energy. And we did a video go in depth on the ice baths where I looked at cryotherapy and whole body cryotherapy. Same principles apply here. It's all about just dropping core temp. And that's the, the goal there. The, the benefits are not very pronounced in studies and there's and it's tricky to actually find where it's benefiting endurance athletes substantially and there's downsides to it and there's just a lot of different things like that so you can to hannah's point you can really get caught up in all this sort of stuff that's trying to tell you that you need to do this in order to to get better but really it's the training that matters uh, most yeah and yeah. i'm also not saying that some of these things don't improve you for example if reflex training improves you one percent that's great it's an improvement but maybe the extra training you would do would improve you five percent it it's just a no-brainer I, I think too that it's, it's never like the reflex it's not the reflexes limiter it's the should i go with this move or not 
kind of thing and like your hesitation mm-hmm. inside of it and your decision yeah. in that and i don't know how to train that with a reflex like just you know hit this light when it turns on bop it kind of thing um going well, back to i, I asked chachi oh, go ahead go ahead or take us off topic oh. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, before we go to, I'm to AI, to <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I feel like with off-road and, um, you know, things like XC too, like Nate is saying, it's not just, uh, reacting, it's making the decision and so much of off-road leveling up with, um, mountain biking for me has been confidence of seeing something for the first time and knowing, uh, being able to quickly process how to write it. Have I written something like this before? What did the person ahead of me do? Um, and that's not just a reflex thing. It's um, like a really quick processing of your experience and your confidence and like immediate assessment of your ability level next to this thing. And that's so much more than just like, how quickly can my body move? Like how quickly, quickly can I respond? You know? Um, so if, I think it's more complicated than just can you react quickly? It's like a process of assessing your skill and making a plan on the fly, you know? I also will say I went through a period in which I thought that I really needed to focus on reflex training and I was like really dead set on it. And then I just found out I needed glasses. So there's oh. that too. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> That's awesome. Nate, what about ChatGPT? I hate ChatGPT. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. I was wondering, uh, I know there's probably F1 fans yelling at us about how many times do they really drive the car per month? And they do yeah. preseason testing, race weekends. Race weekends, they get to race three times. And uh, that's 20 to 23 races a season. In season testing, which is an average of two days per year. And then filming days, which is an average of two days per year. And it says that pre-t- preseason testing is only six days total, which is crazy. So you put that all together because these cars are (laughs) insanely expensive to run. Just the tires alone, like it's crazy. Um, Anyways, it's about 6.3 times per month that they get to ride their, drive their car year round. So to Ivy's point, imagine if we could only be on the bike six times per month, how many other things we would have to do. Uh, Mm -hmm. Like we would be weight training and like running and and every other kind of aerobic sport we could do um, to, to make up for that volume loss. But I bet you if they could drive their car 31 days per month, um, they would probably do a lot less other stuff, but they can't. Yeah. Can I, I want to take this like to the nth degree that probably doesn't apply to most of us amateurs, but I'm thinking if you're at the pro Peloton reflexes do matter, like, um, and being able to do that. And I know in this, the sport that I came from in motocross, there were a lot of athletes that got popped for Adderall um, that were taking Adderall without prescriptions because in that sport, like it's just the consequence is so high. Everything is happening so fast and you're reacting to subtle changes in dirt texture or something else that you're visually taking in. That's like, okay, that jump there, that line that I was going to take is now going to make me crash. So I Mm. have to like change in one, one thousandth of a second and change something. Your brain starts smoking like, you know, we're talking metaphorically here when it has to process all that. And that's when you, you miss things and you don't make those right decisions. And instead these athletes taking Adderall, they were like, everything's on easy mode, mentally speaking. Like I'm, I feel like I mentally it's on slow motion and I'm able to walk through and just be able to, to do all that. You know, I'm, I know that there's TUEs in place and I know that's also like a commonly prescribed drug and, and one where it probably wouldn't be too difficult if you had a doctor that was like, you know, on the home team, so to speak, to be able to get you something like that. And the, I wonder how it's much even that's that. used, you know, at yeah. the top can level. You, can you use it in, in, in competition yeah. if you have a uh, subscription, a prescription? I don't know. It's a good thing and we should check it while we're talking about this because I'm just thinking, and while you check that, Nate, I'm, ta- I'm thinking like sprint finishes at the tour, like the consequence is so high and you're, you're, you've got 35 riders all around you that are just whittled down to, but you're having to make decisions based off all of them. Ivy's nodding her head because like sprints were her life, you know, for a while. And like, I'm sure anyone can talk about this. Like when you finish a sprint that you've gone through, like, yes, physically you're exhausted, but mentally it is insane. Like you, so you don't go to sleep until like, like this absolute... three in the morning after a, like 6 p.m. <laughs> yeah. crit. Like it's not, yeah, your brain is just, uh, yeah, the wheels are just spinning out totally. I have the answer. Oh, yeah. 
So it's got to be it's got to be beneficial. Uh, in yeah, competition, Nick, prohibited. Out of competition, not prohibited. And is that with or without a TUE? I uh, just state don't. that because I think that if you have a, I think if you have a TUE, you can because I don't think you're gonna get a TUE in, for so this. So WADA was governing this. WADA was governing the sport of Supercross and motocross for a while, and athletes were rushing to get their TUEs so then they could use Adderall all throughout everything, uh, throughout training and racing uh, itself. But to be clear, so we're not I'm, promoting unneeded prescription. <laughs> no, we're not. What I'm talking about is this very same thing, though. I, I, there's reason behind something like this for reflex training, and I would not be surprised if people were trying to get take every advantage that they could on something like this when you're talking about competing at the pointy end of the sport mm -hmm. you know like i could see it um it sucks uh, but that's i'm, I'm trying to figure it out but i could see a tue for out of competition but still not for in for either sure. way because it does have performance enhancing benefit and i can't just be like i have low dopamine i get distracted <laughs> i need to have this stimulant right. in my race uh, uh that doesn't seem to make sense but anyone knows please put in the comments because yeah. yeah yes that'd be great Begin and reference the case of James Stewart, the supercross racer, who was tested in competition, I believe, had Adderall in his system without a TUE, and he was banned because of that for a certain period of time, had to serve a suspension. Um, and the takeaway was if he just had a TUE, it would have been totally fine. Wow. Um, so I'm curious to see if that's the case, if it's TUE in competition legal, because that would be it. I hope that's not happening. Instead, just do your reflex training. Get a bop it. Yeah, I would okay. also, I would love to if <laughs> someone could tell us what the TUE. Um, what the criteria are because there's no test for ADHD. It is symptom based. The ability for somebody to, you know, air quotes, trick a doctor and just saying, these are the symptoms is extremely high. Uh, so I hope that it's not in use. And I'm, I've said this before. I do yeah. take Adderall. It's been life changing for my ability to focus and not have like these really bad, almost like depression days where like, it's really hard to get out of bed and stuff, but I wouldn't, I, I don't think it would be fair to take it during I mean, I get, it's an advantage. I mean, even, even training, right? You feel like you don't want to train. You take Adderall and you're like, you know, you want to train. Um, but also on the, on the flip side, people who have yeah. ADHD have a cognitive, it's like a cognitive disorder or uh, executive function disorder, sorry. And so the amount of days that you don't want to train is really big compared to uh, everybody else. Um, yeah, uh, that sucks. That sucks. There's so much yeah. stuff. I mean, pros, I don't know how you guys do it. Like it, you probably, I would just not think about it. The amount of ways that people can cheat. Right. And it's like for your livelihood, it's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's complicated. <laughs> I think I hit a point. Both of so, you went like, uh, if... <laughs> next question. I was just thinking that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I was, uh, yeah. I was just thinking about how bummed I get that, uh, you know, other pros, um, don't have to work and, um, mm. yeah, like, mm -hmm. Hannah, full transparency. I'm so jealous of uh, you, you and Clayton's relationship. Like, um, I have a wonderful, supportive partner, but like to see uh, Clayton is just like Hannah's mechanic. He is like so down to go like be hands on, supportive of every race, and like it give brings him joy. And like, I think if I asked my significant other to do that, he would be super down for it. But like, that's such a special, cool thing. And apart from performance enhancing things like they're all you can get so caught up uh comparing yourself to other pro athletes and be like oh, this person this person has a trust fund and like hasn't had to work mm -hmm. a job in you know or th these people's parents bought them a house and so they they have like a bigger setup for trainers and a gym and like uh yeah you can get really caught up in that kind of stuff and um yeah, it'll bum me out. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Comparison really is the worst thing you can do. And I think, especially with social media, I mean, it's been said a million times, right, is it becomes easier to compare. But something I always try and remember is that when you do compare and you wish for someone else's circumstances – you would have to take on all their circumstances and we don't know what those other circumstances are and everyone you don't know how bad Clayton is right? in the real no just yeah. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's funny as I as I said that it sounded you need weird help? Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> blink twice if you didn't hear that. <laughs> no I mean no We're 100 you know Clayton's like, so kind. Yeah. Clayton really yeah. Clayton is the best I, he is yeah. a massive advantage that I feel like I have um which is so cool and so special but yeah like to that point when when with other people and it's like oh well they got this um 
opportunity or they got to go to this race or they got this sponsorship it's like oh that's so frustrating but you don't know you know maybe all the sponsorships that they didn't get um Mm -hmm. or all the opportunities that fell through or you know this that or the other Mm -hmm. right so it's like there's always two sides and it's just the sad part Mm -hmm. that like genetics right play a huge like impact in who's going to win a race um then people get you know at the top people the genetics are pretty similar and then it's it's all the other stuff but the other point is that i think it's really great that we bring this up is that like all these athletes especially really successful ones have amazing support systems behind them and uh i don't know many like you know real top level they don't have a huge support system and then maybe those people don't get um mentioned as much as if they didn't have that support system would they really be at that high level and this can be partners coaches friends uh even like a great um, therapist right as part of that support system that doesn't get talked about so that's kind of Mm -hmm. cool to think about it's not just because you think about it's just Mm -hmm. solo right i'm solo i'm riding my bike solo but it's not solo your mechanic uh keegan's keegan's mechanic holy crap what a great support system. He Modern, like travels yeah. the country it's and amazing. like just fixes his bike, does everything the day before. And then they'll sit on the course and like hand him bottles. He's like so chill. And like his, his energy is calming. And you just want to like, you just like, yeah. you can't stress around him. You're just like, oh yeah, um, this is going to be amazing. Uh, yeah. What a great guy. Shout and out, Lauren, a, we love yeah. you. <laughs> what a great support system though for Keegan. Right. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of a better one yeah. for, uh, on that side with the mechanic. Yeah. I covered all this in detail. Actually, this is like the debate that in the Ozempic video that we just published. Uh, you can check it out on YouTube. Go to it now, where we talk about one of the things that WADA considers to consider like a, a, a substance, a performance enhancing drug is if it violates the spirit of the sport. Mm-hmm. And the silly the, kind of the tricky part about that is that kind of is like, all right, so the spirit of the sport almost operates on this premise of an equal and level playing field. And is that flawed in and of itself, right? Because Mm -hmm. nobody starts at the same spot. Everyone's standing on the shoulders of somebody or lacking shoulders to stand on. It's all, it's all different. So money's huge. Yeah. It'll be money is that, that like, yeah, it'd be so interesting if you, this would not happen, but almost like a squid game esque thing where you take athletes and they just live exactly the same on some Island. Right. And they train and then who wins then like they get the same equipment (laughs) or you know everyone gets the same bike the same tires uh there's nothing the same skin suit ivy's in for squid game she's like bring me i'm gonna win this thing she's like (laughs) ivy was like "Mm, yeah she's yeah (laughs) and if you could like somehow make the hormones the same for each person the genetics that would be so amazing just to see but then it would then really be who who so wants it the most right who can be the smartest <laughs> yeah. in training and who has the most grit with eliminating that impossible to do unless yeah. maybe we're an ai simulation and they could like do a level like that that would be cool <laughs> 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 but yeah that, uh, that's not how yeah. real life is so it's it is it, to the spirit of the sport is yeah. spirit of the sport of like this this college kid can buy a 2500 hundred dollar disc reel while this college kid can't i mean they yeah. they are disc reels still banned in in uh in collegiate cycling in the u.s they were for a while because I think of the uh, price. But... Man, mm-hmm. yeah, they were. Mm-hmm. I would bet that they were pretty far still. out of college I would, now. I'd not be surprised. Um, but anyways, that's the. It's to yeah. the. Uh, <laughs> I remember being out of college and seeing triathletes, and it's the forty-five-year-old, uh, very successful man who can train all this time and barely works, and has like goes to Kona twice a year for a training camp, has a ten thousand dollar bike, has a coach, mm-hmm. has the food made right, and then mm-hmm. someone who's like, mm-hmm. you got like a. A huffy right with some arrow clip on bars and those were expensive and it's, it's just the way it is yeah it's the best is though when that person beats yeah. the person with all the money that's the best like we love that story oh, it's yeah, everyone motivation. loves that story mm-hmm. right the mike it's tyson great. who comes out yeah and just like totally grit yeah yeah that's what we go for hannah do you ever find yourself sorry we're probably getting this is getting way more than you know this for is this a, question yeah this, this is relevant yeah. for uh <laughs> but, competitors at yeah. like the beginning level too like this is good mm-hmm. stuff to hear oh, you can get but, so wrapped up and yeah it's poison to be like this person has this why you know i didn't get to start when i was a junior i didn't get to do you know you can just spiral don't but, do it before we go to hannah this is why hannah's point of process goals and then comparing to yourself are so freaking important because you can't control everyone else. And process goals are, I'm going to give it my all in this interval and not give up. I'm going to do this like training plan. I'm going to eat after meals. I'm going to stretch, you know, this sort of thing. New Year's is coming up, right? Really great time to talk about your process goals. Outcome goal is I want to do a sub hour 40 KTT. I want to win this race. You don't really have direct control over that. Like you do with, I'm going to eat this meal or I'm going to have this food. I'm going to, uh, train this many, um, I'm going to get on the bike and try my best for this 
uh, for this interval. And then if you too, with, if you use trainer road and you have the combination of your workout levels and your FTP, you can see yourself getting faster after every workout, you complete that workout and those levels go up. You just got faster, right? And you're just measuring it the whole time. Feels you get good. these little incremental steps. You don't have to wait 30 days for your FTP to go up. That is for me has always been the motivation. And then I show up at the race and have fun. And you see those videos on trainer.com where we are, uh, you tra- youtube.com slash trainer road, where I would be in races and I would make so many mistakes and Pete would like help me with it. It was so much fun. It didn't matter that I didn't <laughs> win every race. I mean, it mattered a little bit, but like, it didn't matter that much. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people had better exactly. stuff than me, but anyways, that's the process goals. Last week's in like, amen. Nate. <laughs> uh, in last week's podcast, Keegan, Nate asked Keegan the question of like, uh, how do you deal with that when you assume that, or you think or suspect that somebody might be doping and Keegan's answer was just beat them. <laughs> um, but I'm curious, Hannah, do you ever put yourself in that underdog, that huffy with a clip on situation that Nate said, like mentally put yourself there to give yourself some more drive or how do you manage the perceived inequality that you have against your competitors? And granted, I'm not saying this, that you're in a disadvantaged position. You're in a relatively advantaged position to so many, right? But just the same, how do you manage that? Um, it's a big question because I think there's a lot of elements to it. You know, I think, I, I think to some extent for me, ignoring the things that you can't change are sometimes important. Um, and by that, I mean, you think maybe someone's cheating, but there's no way to know and you do all the appropriate things or whatever. It's like, I'm not going to sit around and put myself in even a worse spot by dwelling on the fact that this person maybe doesn't have the correct uh, conscious. There's no um, point. Instead, yeah, exactly. Only There's bad. no point. Instead, I'm just going to focus on bettering myself. And also, I think those are moments where gratitude is a really, really powerful tool. It actually, experiencing gratitude you know, works different parts of your brain um, than otherwise. It really does open you up to creativity. And so I think for me, a lot of that is practicing gratitude for the things that you do have. And like you said, I mean, there, there are plenty of things that behind the scenes I could sit around and say, well, I don't have this and this person has this and I don't have this and this person has this, you know, if, but Ivy's already said, you know, from the outside looking in, oh my gosh, look what I do have. You know, Ivy sees that I have that big advantage. And I think, gosh, I'm just so grateful for those things. You know, I mean, I've, I have a coach that I fully trust. I have Clayton, who's a mechanic. He used, he travels with me to 90% of the events. He used to race pro enduro. So he's a skills coach. Like, I mean, I think to toot his horn, but also to show people how they can gain advantages that, that are, different maybe than what other people see is you know before the third stage at La Ruta, I woke up and I looked at Clayton and I said I feel like garbage I I'm gonna have a terrible day today and he just looked at me and said oh man this is gonna be your best day of the race you know and I it made such a big difference to hear that and that's not something that anyone else hears or sees or knows, but that's an advantage. And so I would just encourage anyone who's feeling like they're at a disadvantage to look back and maybe try and think about what are the things that you have that others don't. It could be it could be emotional support, it could be financial support, it could be um, your living circumstances. Maybe you live somewhere that you really love. Not everyone has that, and get you know, it, it's all these small things that add up. And I just think it's really important to be intentional about what you acknowledge and what you maybe ignore as and, well. I mean, Practicing the, gratitude should be a well, process goal. It should be part of your process yeah. goal. Sorry, go ahead, Nate. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. And to the gratitude, you know, you can pair like, I wish I was like this pro. And then you can think of, oh, I look at this person in a corporate job in the US who doesn't get to race bikes at all. And then I look into maybe a, a disadvantaged country and what those people are going through, you know, or a country at war and like that. And you're like, well, maybe it's not so bad that I race my bike. And some people cheat, but who cares? Like, <laughs> yeah. I still get to have a pretty good life mm-hmm. yeah, uh, exactly. inside of this. And then it's like, wow, that this is all really, really, really good. The, the thing about this too, yeah. how many, okay, 7.7 billion people on the planet, how many people would, would change themselves with your life right now? Everyone listening, oh, billions, yeah, right? 
billions of people would be like, boom, I'd switch right now with you in a heartbeat. You think about that and you're like, wow, a billion, I can't even comprehend that number, but it's billions that would do that. That's amazing. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Something I like to promote, um, if you feel like gratitude or negativity are things that you struggle with is keeping a gratitude journal and it's super small. That's the whole point is it has to be short and small so that you can be consistent with it. Um, and a lot of the time I'll just even do it on maybe the notes of your ride. Even you just write three things that during your workout went well. And they can be big things like I hit this interval that I've never hit before, or it can be super small. Like if you're riding outside, I saw a pretty tree, you know, like just find that thing and you build this gratitude over time. And then all of a sudden you can open this gratitude journal or look back and see thousands of good things that can, that have happened. And for me, I think that's really cool and can make a big difference on the days that are hard. Um, I used to do it with an ex-girlfriend. We would text each other things that we're grateful in the morning. Uh, she was in recovery mm -hmm. and she did AA stuff and she actually had a company that would help people with that. And it would be like, you know, I'm thankful to be healthy today and be alive, like things like that. And other ones would be, I'm grateful for this friend in my life who supports me so much. I'm grateful that I get to do mm -hmm. something that I love. Um, and then the, the fact that we were doing it back and forth and she would send it to a mentor too. It's like this accountability because they would send it back and forth. And it's like, mm -hmm. hey, you maybe miss a day sometimes, but where's your, where's your gratefulness list? And that was pretty fun. Mm. What a yeah. wonderful thing to get to share with someone else every day though, too. Like, I love that. Maybe you do it with a friend or a training partner or something. And if you're sending someone something you're grateful for, that will benefit them as well. I know that when someone tells me something they're happy about, it usually makes me feel happy mm -hmm. too. <laughs> yeah. And some of you may already do this in ways that feel less like a gratitude journal, but they actually are you expressing it to yourself or to somebody else too. And maybe just like hearing this, like when you share your workout to your friend that in all reality, you may not be looking forward to that hard workout that you have coming up or something, but you share it with your friend and you're like, you know, you're stoking the fire and you're gassing each other up and you're helping each other. That can, those, these are all these sort of like accountability systems that you can put into place and these mechanisms to help you uh, stay on track with it. And if you're not Good combo. stoked about um, your fitness and don't feel like you're going to be able to text your buddy and be like, Hey man, I nailed this workout, um, set a process goal. Like I'm going to try to eat 90 grams of carbs per hour in this workout. And then when you do it, you get to say that like, Hey man, I did it. Mm -hmm. I don't look at all this candy I ate, you know, um, set those process goals. Like you get to have little, little wins and things to be grateful for much more often when you have really simple process goals, like just getting on your bike, just doing a workout two or three days a week, you know? Um, set process goals. Great advice, Ivy. Uh, last question. DJ says, Hey there, train road team. My question today is regarding rest weeks and the optimal way to program them. I've been listening to your podcast for quite some time now. Thanks DJ. Uh, and if you're listening right now and you haven't shared the podcast with somebody this week, please do that. That would be huge. Um, if you've shared it in the past, share it with somebody new this week. That's like, that just means the world to us. We're super grateful for it. Uh, I've been listening to your pod or sorry, it says, and I've also learned a ton from this about the science of getting faster and having realized how much of that comes down to optimizing the balance of stress and recovery. However, one big question remains on my mind with the knowledge that we tend to lose our fitness in the higher intensity zones much faster than we do in the lower intensity zones. Why are trainer road rest weeks programmed the way they are, which first of all, I want to clarify that we don't program our rest weeks in a unique way. That's like super weird or anything else like that. Um, it's just, a, you know, we follow basic uh, science-based and time-proven principles for, mm -hmm. for programming rest weeks. Uh, then says, wouldn't something closer to a taper week, i.e. drastically reducing volume while maintaining intensity, be more optimal for shedding fatigue while maintaining fitness? Do our bodies just need a full-on break from all high-intensity intervals every four to six weeks? I've always followed my program re programmed recovery weeks to a T and will continue to do so moving forward no matter the answer, but I'd love for you all to help me understand the science here. Thanks. Um, uh, Ivy, you're re you referenced an article that we have on our website that breaks down and we're talking about like, this is a uh, energy system and different, like different zone fatigue, or I should say like loss of performance. And in some cases here, it's talking about like return to baselines. So that's why it will seem and whatever like baseline might be for an individual. Mm -hmm. But do you want to run through what the, what those are, um, roughly for us? Ivy? Yeah. What DJ is referring to when, uh, 
referring to the knowledge that we have about our loss of fitness and the decay rate. So the amount of time that passes, if you don't train this system, you lose fitness in this system is what we're referring to. Um, and what, uh, so decay rate for a sprint system is just five days. So if you don't do um, a sprint workout or exercise that system in five days, you'll start to lose fitness in that area. For muscular endurance, um, detraining doesn't happen for around 15 days. Anaerobic capacity it takes 18 days. Anaerobic capacity or aerobic endurance is 30 days or more. So I think DJ's, mm-hmm. you know, knows this information. We we've covered it. It's, you know understood amongst coaches and athletes we know this so i think dj is kind of like why would we ever stop training then why do we have rest weeks i think that's the question right um looking at a rest week or what we see as something that's um low intensity and wondering why don't we just keep training if it only takes this long to lose fitness in these areas yeah i will tell you um yeah so go ahead (laughs) what it's interesting to think of that like so i'm just going to reduce the uh volume and do really intense, like maybe 30 minute workouts. Uh, and that could be better than doing maybe some easier rides during that recovery week. And so what we're doing is that like in your, uh, your, your block of let's say a three week block of, uh, training in a row, you're slowly getting fatigued that whole time. Right. And then when you rest, you're getting this super compensation where you're going to get more, you're going to come back stronger than you were before. And if you don't give you that period of rest, that super compensation doesn't get to happen. Um, inside of a, a, a taper, uh, and you might not be as sharp that first workout back, right? You might not be as sharp, but overall, you're going to be better off repeating this system over again. So for a taper, you're going you're gonna to reduce the hours and you're going to shed that fatigue in a different way. And you're going to be sharper, but probably if you sustain that all the time, um, you're, you know, you, you're probably going to have tired muscles like I had for years. Uh, that's interesting though. It could, it, I mean, honestly, it could be a valid approach if you do a low enough volume, um, that you're going to get the same result, but also it's a great mental break to just ride easy and watch TV. If you're training inside or just like chill, it, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. I looked into studies on this and Ivy, you're actually creating a, a short video on this right now on this topic. Um, but there's, so there is a study and we'll link to it here where it looked at athletes during their off season. So different circumstances. Okay. We're not talking about building fitness incrementally, like Nate just mentioned. So this is different. This is just during an off season. And it looked at athletes that didn't do anything during an off season or did like very minimal aerobic work. And then those that did one hard workout a week, uh, and hard as in high intensity workout a week. And then it looked at like who came out of the off season better and no surprise those that came out of the off season better were those that did that one hard workout a week. But this is an off season when you're looking at actually allowing yourself to improve time after time, after time, going through a loading phase of training like that base build and specialty. That's where in almost every circumstance, I bet somebody listening to this has found the fact that sometimes it gets hard to stay on top of things going all the way through to your goal event, because life throws you a curveball, Something happens. It gets difficult. And we have this fear that taking any time off is somehow getting slower. It's like that we're always on this slope. And if we stop walking, we slide down the slope backwards. So I always need to be running ahead, but that is the sort of mentality that just gets you fatigued. And it's, um, I have to remind myself constantly during my recovery weeks that the frustration I'm feeling today is going to pay off in ability later on. And like, I I have to remind myself that if I don't, I will get too frustrated with it and I'll go out and I'll do something too hard. And that's why having a training plan to follow is so important for this. Because really, if you're looking at this and DJ, if you went through on every workout you just did, or every week that you had a recovery week, you did one hard workout, you might, you probably aren't going to increase your fitness much. Think about that one hard workout a week, which really is going to be a short and abbreviated high intensity workout. Whereas during the week, you already have these really well-structured, progressive, great workouts that are all building on top of each other. And then one time a week, you just insert this one thing. You're not dosing your body with effective like strain that's going to make you faster, but you are dosing your body with strain that's going to make you more fatigued. And your goal during a rest week isn't to get faster. It's to build up reserves. That should be your goal. You should be putting all that energy up into like, you know, making yourself better, bigger, better, stronger, more rested. That allows you to actually do more in the week. You know, 
Hannah, this has got to be hard for you as a pro, once again, because you're paid. <laughs> so you probably feel that like fear of sliding down the slope way Panic. more than I do. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think one reason that taper weeks and rest weeks look very different from each other is in a taper week, our goal is to optimize form. So we want to be at our absolute highest level of fitness while having the least amount of feet fatigue. So you're trying to meet this in the middle and that middle intersection is where your form is. And you want that form to be really good going into a race. But in a recovery week, we don't really care where that form number is. What we really just care about is minimizing that fatigue as fast as possible so that then we can keep building that fitness up. And so that's one reason why sometimes tapers can last as long as two weeks because we are slowly trying to reach that intersection for form to be perfect without allowing that fitness to dip. But recovery weeks, we don't want it to extend two weeks. We want to get back to the training. And so we're trying to really shed that fatigue as fast as possible, which again, as everyone said, is why it makes the most sense to just keep it nice and easy so that we can get back to our regular scheduled programming. Yeah. Well said. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Great episode. Thanks Hannah for joining us here. And thanks to Nate and Ivy. Uh, if you appreciated this podcast, subscribe on our YouTube channel, give this video a thumbs up, you can hit a notification bell so, that, bell so then you're notified whenever we upload new videos and we're uploading new videos all the time. So go and check that out. And if you have not yet signed up for Trainer Road, now is the time. You should do it. People in over 150 countries are doing it all the time. Join the wave. So we'll talk to you all next time. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.